Chapter 1. Gun Control vs. Gun Rights, America's Enduring Dilemma. 1.1 Gun Laws and the Second Amendment, A Historical Perspective. Gun laws in the United States have a complex history intertwined with the fabric of the nation's identity. The Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, adopted on December 15, 1791, as part of the Bill of Rights, states, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This language has led to divergent interpretations. Originally, the amendment was seen within the context of service in state militias, but over time, the focus has shifted to individual gun ownership rights. The early republic did not question the need for an armed populace. Firearms were essential for defense, hunting, and law enforcement on the frontier. Early gun laws reflected these necessities, with regulations focusing more on gun storage and usage rather than restrictions on ownership. During this period, gun ownership was also linked with civic responsibility, as Americans were expected to be ready to serve in militias to defend their communities and the young nation. Throughout the 19th century, as America expanded westward, gun laws evolved to meet the changing landscape of the nation. In frontier towns, local ordinances often required visitors to surrender their firearms to prevent violence. These laws showcase an early example of balancing gun rights with public safety concerns. However, the widespread prevalence of firearms and the necessity of self-protection in less regulated territories meant that comprehensive gun control was neither feasible nor supported by the population. The turn of the 20th century brought new challenges, as industrialization and urbanization transformed American society. The infamous St. Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929, along with other acts of violence associated with organized crime during the Prohibition era, spurred the first federal gun control laws. The National Firearms Act of 1934 and the Federal Firearms Act of 1938 introduced a series of regulations, including the requirement for certain types of firearms to be registered and for firearms dealers to be licensed. The debate over gun control versus gun rights entered a new phase with the assassinations of President John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., and Senator Robert Kennedy in the 1960s. Public outcry led to the Gun Control Act of 1968, which expanded licensing and record-keeping requirements and restricted firearm sales across state lines. Despite these laws, the underlying tension between restricting access to firearms and ensuring the rights of individuals to bear arms persisted. In 1971, the organization now known as the National Rifle Association (NRA) began lobbying in earnest against gun control legislation, marking a shift in their activities. For much of its history, the NRA had been focused on promoting gun safety and marksmanship. From this point forward, the NRA increased its political influence, working to protect and expand access to firearms based on a particular interpretation of the Second Amendment, one that emphasized individual rights over collective security. This interpretation eventually led to a landmark Supreme Court case, District of Columbia v. Heller, in 2008. Here, the court held that the Second Amendment protected an individual's right to possess a firearm unconnected to service in a militia, and to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. The decision represented a monumental shift in the legal understanding of the Second Amendment and its application, catalyzing new debates surrounding gun laws and regulation. In the aftermath of Heller, gun control advocates have continued to push for stricter laws, citing the increasing number of mass shootings as evidence of the need for reform. They argue that common-sense measures such as universal background checks, assault weapons bans, and red flag laws could help reduce gun violence without infringing on the rights of responsible gun owners. Opponents of further gun control measures maintain that such laws would be ineffective and argue that they could infringe upon the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens. They posit that the solution to gun violence lies not in more laws, but in better enforcement of existing laws, mental health interventions, and improved security measures. The legal landscape surrounding gun control continues to evolve as individual states enact their own laws in response to local events and political pressures. 
For example, some states have adopted constitutional carry laws that allow individuals to carry a concealed firearm without a permit, while others have imposed strict licensing requirements and safe storage laws to prevent firearms from falling into the wrong hands. The cultural attachment to guns in the United States further complicates the issue. Many Americans view gun ownership as a symbol of freedom and individualism, a heritage that is celebrated and protected. This cultural perspective is often at odds with the public health approach advocated by gun control proponents, who argue that firearms should be regulated like any other dangerous product to minimize harm. As America grapples with its enduring dilemma of gun control versus gun rights, future legal battles and policy decisions will undoubtedly continue to shape the landscape. The balancing act between individual rights and collective safety has been a hallmark of the nation's history, reflecting the complex relationship Americans have with guns. As this relationship evolves, the question remains, how will the United States navigate the murky waters of gun control while upholding the principles deemed essential by the Second Amendment? The debate is sure to be informed by the lessons of history, current events, and the ever-changing political and social climate. 1.2 Mass Shootings Triggers and Responses The issue of mass shootings in the United States represents one of the most distressing and divisive elements in the broader debate over gun control and gun rights. With each incident, the nation is drawn into a complex conversation about the causes of these tragedies and the most effective responses to prevent their occurrence. Mass shootings are typically defined as incidents in which a gunman kills four or more people in a single episode. These devastating events occur in schools, places of worship, entertainment venues, and workplaces, leaving communities shattered and sparking nationwide grief. The triggers for mass shootings are varied and often multifaceted. In some cases, the shooters have a history of mental illness or emotional distress that may have contributed to their actions. In others, ideological extremism, whether rooted in political, religious, or social beliefs, can be the catalyst. It is also important to note that a history of domestic violence or previous violence is common among mass shooters. The mix of personal, societal, and psychological factors involved makes it difficult to predict and prevent these crimes. The role of firearms, particularly the ease of access to high-capacity weapons, is a central issue in discussions of mass shootings. Gun rights advocates argue that the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution protects an individual's right to own guns, and that responsible gun ownership is not the cause of mass shootings. They contend that focusing on the tools used by the perpetrators rather than the perpetrators themselves misses the root of the problem. On the other side of the debate, gun control supporters assert that the availability of firearms, especially those designed to kill many people in a short amount of time, significantly contributes to the deadliness of mass shooting events. After each mass shooting, there's a pattern of public response that unfolds. Vigils and memorials are organized to honor the victims. The media coverage intensifies, bringing to light the events and often catalyzing a national conversation on gun policy. Social media becomes a platform for both mourning and activism, with calls for change in legislation or mental health support trending. Politicians, community leaders, and activists make statements and, in some instances, propose new policies. The legislative response to mass shootings has been inconsistent at the federal level, with significant resistance to new gun control measures. Some states, however, have enacted their own laws in the wake of these tragedies. They have pursued things like background check expansions, red flag laws allowing temporary removal of guns from individuals deemed to be a threat, and bans on certain types of firearms or high-capacity magazines. These state-level actions demonstrate a willingness to address at least some aspects of the complex issue, but also highlight the patchwork nature of the United States' approach to gun laws. The impact of mass shootings extends beyond the immediate loss of life and emotional trauma inflicted on survivors and the victims' families. There are long-lasting effects on the communities where these shootings occur. Schools, for instance, have increased security measures, ranging from entry control systems to active shooter drills, fundamentally altering the educational environment. 
Local businesses and places of worship also reconsider their security protocols, often increasing their reliance on security personnel and surveillance systems. In the context of preventing mass shootings, the debate often leads to a discussion on the effectiveness of various measures. Gun control advocates propose that restrictions on the sale and ownership of certain types of firearms could reduce the lethality of mass shootings or prevent them altogether. Conversely, advocates for gun rights suggest that such measures would not deter someone intent on causing harm and that instead arming responsible citizens could help avert or mitigate these events. Mental health is another crucial aspect of this discussion as advocates from both sides of the gun debate often agree on the need for better mental health care. The argument is that identifying and treating individuals with mental illness could prevent them from becoming mass shooters. However, experts caution that the relationship between mental illness and mass shootings is not straightforward, and the majority of people with mental health issues are not violent. The challenge is in creating policies that can effectively target the small fraction of individuals who might pose a risk without stigmatizing mental illness as a whole. Another response to the mass shooting epidemic has been the rise of grassroots movements advocating for gun control. Notably, after the 2018 shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, students and their allies formed March for Our Lives, a movement that organized one of the largest mass protests in American history. These movements leverage public sentiment, particularly in the immediate aftermath of shootings, to push for legislative change and challenge the political power of gun rights organizations like the National Rifle Association. Despite the entrenched positions on both sides of the gun control debate, there is some evidence of shifting public opinion. According to surveys, a growing majority of Americans support specific measures such as universal background checks and red flag laws. However, this consensus falls apart when it comes to more contentious policies like banning assault-style weapons or implementing mandatory gun buyback programs. The complicated political landscape, with the Senate filibuster and intense partisanship, often stalls legislative efforts in Congress, even when certain measures enjoy widespread public support. The media play a pivotal role in shaping the discourse following mass shootings. There is increasing scrutiny on how these events are reported, including ethical considerations around the repetition of the shooter's name and manifesto, which some worry might inspire future shooters. Efforts to focus on the victims and heroes of these tragedies, rather than glorifying the perpetrator, are growing as a best practice in journalistic reporting. This shift in focus also aligns with the public's desire to honor the memory of the victims and to prevent the sensationalism of these tragic events. Looking at how other countries respond to mass shootings can provide a contrasting perspective to the United States' approach. In nations like Australia and New Zealand, for example, single mass shootings have led to swift and significant overhauls of gun laws. Such examples are often cited in American debates as proof that more restrictive gun policies can be effective. However, opponents point out differences in national cultures and constitutions, arguing that what works in one country might not be applicable or effective in another. In the wake of mass shootings, there are also calls to address broader societal issues that may contribute to these events. Discussions extend into the realms of toxic masculinity, cultural violence, and the role of social isolation and the internet in radicalizing individuals. Advocates for gun rights might agree that societal factors need attention, but remain firm in their belief that guns themselves are not the problem. Gun control advocates, however, often see these factors as part of the justification for stricter gun laws. Education and training programs for law enforcement and civilians are proposed as potential means to reduce the harm caused by mass shootings. Active shooter training, for instance, aims to prepare individuals for how to respond in the event of a shooting. There is debate, however, about the psychological impact of such training on participants, especially when this involves children in school settings. The prominence of run, hide, fight as a mantra reflects the acceptance that mass shootings are now a part of the American reality that people must be prepared to face. Analyzing the responses to mass shootings reveals a complex intertwining of personal principles, political convictions, and practical considerations. 
Americans remain divided on how to reconcile the cherished right to bear arms with the urgent need to prevent mass shooting tragedies. What remains clear is that mass shootings are a grave and recurring crisis, one that demands thoughtful and comprehensive policy responses that address both the immediate horror and the underlying conditions that allow such violence to propagate. 1.3 The NRA versus Gun Control Advocacy, a Battle of Ideologies The National Rifle Association, NRA, and gun control advocacy groups represent the two opposing poles of American thought regarding firearms policy. The NRA, founded in 1871, has evolved from an organization focused on marksmanship and gun safety into a political powerhouse dedicated to protecting the Second Amendment rights of American citizens. The organization's stance is that gun ownership is a fundamental right protected by the Constitution and that restrictions on gun ownership are infringements upon this liberty. They emphasize the importance of an armed populace for personal defense and as a safeguard against tyranny. The NRA not only lobbies lawmakers to oppose new gun control legislation, but also endorses candidates who support Second Amendment rights and provides legal assistance in cases challenging gun regulations. Gun control advocacy groups, on the other hand, vary in their specific missions but generally agree on the need for more stringent gun laws. These organizations, including Every Town for Gun Safety, the Brady Campaign, and Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, argue that the United States faces a gun violence epidemic that can be addressed through comprehensive background checks, restrictions on the sale of certain types of firearms, and the prohibition of sales to individuals who pose a danger to themselves or others. They often present data linking lower rates of gun violence to stricter gun laws and call attention to mass shootings, daily gun violence, and suicides involving firearms as evidence of the need for reform. The NRA bases its arguments on a strict interpretation of the Second Amendment, which reads, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They posit that this amendment guarantees an individual's right to possess and carry firearms without significant government interference. The organization often references the 2008 Supreme Court case District of Columbia v. Heller, which established that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia. The NRA and its supporters argue that this right is as fundamental as the rights to free speech or religion and that gun ownership is an essential part of American identity and tradition. Contrastingly, gun control advocates focus on the well-regulated aspect of the Second Amendment and the practical need to reduce gun-related deaths and injuries. They endorse a living constitution framework, which considers the evolving nature of society and technology. Advocates contend that when the Second Amendment was ratified in 1791, the framers could not have anticipated modern weapons lethality. Therefore, they argue that regulation does not equate to an infringement, but rather a necessary adjustment for public safety in a country with more civilian-owned firearms than any other in the world. This perspective is often articulated with the acknowledgement that certain regulations can coexist with responsible gun ownership. The NRA's strategies for advocating its position include political lobbying, campaign financing, and public outreach. The organization has been influential in shaping gun policy and public opinion through its vast membership base, well-funded operations, and extensive grassroots activities. Its tactics range from running issue-based ads and social media campaigns, to hosting educational programs and youth events, to promote gun safety and shooting sports. The NRA also grades politicians on their gun policy stances, influencing elections and legislative battles. Through its political action committees, PACs, the NRA contributes to the campaigns of pro-gun rights candidates, further leveraging its influence on gun policy. Meanwhile, gun control advocacy groups also use a combination of public campaigns, legal challenges, and legislative lobbying to achieve their goals. They aim to mobilize public opinion and sway lawmakers by focusing on the human cost of gun violence and presenting research on the effects of gun policy. These groups often partner with survivors of gun violence and leverage their stories to highlight the need for policy change. 
They also work to counteract the NRA's influence in political campaigns by endorsing and financially supporting candidates who champion gun control measures. The NRA and gun control advocates approach the public debate from different foundational beliefs about crime and safety. The NRA argues that a well-armed populace deters crime, suggesting that if more law-abiding citizens carried firearms, they could potentially stop violent criminals in their tracks, reducing overall crime rates. This argument hinges on the idea that criminals are less likely to attack if there is a higher risk they will encounter armed resistance. The NRA frequently cites instances where armed citizens have thwarted violent crimes, supporting their claim. Gun control organizations counter this view, asserting that more guns lead to more violence. They argue that increased gun prevalence escalates confrontations into deadly encounters and that firearms in the home increase the risk of accidental shootings, domestic violence deaths, and suicides. These groups highlight research and statistics indicating that countries with stricter gun control laws have lower rates of gun-related homicides and suicides. Additionally, they argue that the presence of more guns does not necessarily lead to less crime, and that introducing firearms into volatile situations may increase the risk of violence rather than diminish it. Both sides deal with challenges in advancing their agendas. The NRA has faced scrutiny over its financial practices and internal governance, leading to investigations and a loss of public trust in some segments of society. Moreover, the NRA's hardline stance on gun regulations has come under criticism, even from some gun owners who support limited forms of gun control. This suggests a potential disconnect between the NRA's leadership and the more nuanced views held by the general population of gun owners. Gun control advocacy groups confront the obstacle of a strong cultural attachment to gun ownership in many parts of the United States, which complicates efforts to pass gun control measures. They also face the challenge of overcoming the considerable political and financial influence wielded by the NRA. Despite these hurdles, gun control advocates have gained ground at the state level, where several states have enacted measures such as expanded background checks and red flag laws, which allow courts to temporarily remove guns from individuals deemed to be at risk of harming themselves or others. The debate between the NRA and gun control advocacy groups is not just a clash over policy, but a deep-rooted ideological conflict about the role of firearms in American society. The NRA promotes the idea of guns as an embodiment of freedom and self-reliance, while gun control advocates emphasize the need for a balance between individual rights and communal safety. This dichotomy reflects a broader tension in American politics between individual liberties and collective responsibilities, making compromises on the issue of gun control particularly challenging. At the crossroads of this entrenched battle, both sides continue to exert considerable effort and resources to sway opinion and policy in their favor. The NRA works to entrench gun rights within American political culture, identifying itself with American values and heritage. Meanwhile, gun control groups advocate for a re-evaluation of these values in the context of modern violence and public health concerns. This tussle of ideologies is unlikely to abate soon, as each new incident of gun violence rekindles the debate and prompts calls for change or preservation of the status quo, depending on one's perspective. The NRA versus gun control advocacy represents a microcosm of a struggle that continues to shape America's identity and its approach to rights, responsibilities, and the safety of its citizens. 1.4 State versus Federal, the Patchwork of Gun Laws The debate over gun control in the United States is significantly compounded by the division of legislative powers between the federal and state governments. This results in a diverse tapestry of regulations that affect citizens differently, depending on which state they reside in. The constitutional underpinning of this debate is the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution, which states, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This has been subject to various interpretations over the years with some Americans viewing it as an absolute right and others seeing it as one that can be subject to reasonable restrictions for the sake of public safety. 
The federal government has enacted several laws that set a baseline for gun control across the country. Included in these are the National Firearms Act of 1934, which regulates the sale, transfer, and ownership of certain types of firearms, the Gun Control Act of 1968, which expands the regulation to more types of firearms and includes licensing requirements for dealers, and the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act of 1993, which introduced background checks for gun purchases from licensed dealers. The latter was particularly significant, as it marked a concerted effort at a federal level to ensure a minimum standard of background checking that aimed to prevent firearms from falling into the hands of those deemed unsuitable such as felons or those with a history of mental illness. Despite these overarching federal regulations, the United States has not fully yielded control of gun legislation to the federal government. Instead, states have established their own sets of laws that can vary widely from one another. Some states have chosen to implement much more stringent gun control measures. For example, California has an assault weapons ban, a 10-day waiting period on gun purchases, and a limit on the capacity of magazines. These additional restrictions are a clear reflection of the state's political culture and response to the unique challenges it faces, such as urban crime and mass shootings. On the other end of the spectrum are states like Texas, which tend to prioritize the rights aspect of the gun control debate over the imposition of control measures. Here, the legislature has made a conscious decision to adopt more permissive regulations concerning firearms. Texas has laws that allow for the open carry of rifles without a permit and a concealed carry license that is relatively easy to obtain. The rationale in these states is often rooted in the belief that citizens should have the ability to defend themselves and that introducing burdensome restrictions infringes upon their constitutional rights. The situation becomes further complicated when considering how states recognize gun rights across their borders through mechanisms like reciprocity agreements. Some states will acknowledge a concealed carry permit issued by another state, much like they do with driver's licenses, while others do not. This creates a complex network of rights and regulations that a gun owner must navigate, especially if they plan to travel with their weapon. Another pivotal factor in the state versus federal gun law dynamic is preemption. In many instances, state laws are written to have preemption over local ordinances. This means that the state law supersedes any local laws which could be more restrictive. The intent is often to prevent a confusing patchwork of regulations within a single state, but it also can nullify the efforts of local governments to address gun violence that may be more prevalent or present different issues than in other parts of the state. This preemption can result in legal battles between city governments trying to protect their populations and state governments maintaining their laws as the supreme authority. For example, some cities have attempted to pass local bans on high-capacity magazines, but have found themselves in conflict with state laws that prohibit such local measures. This often leaves urban areas, which may face higher rates of gun violence, with limited resources and authority to address the issue effectively through targeted legislation. Given the federalist system of government in the United States, the judicial system plays a pivotal role in interpreting and reconciling the tension between state and federal gun laws. The Supreme Court has been instrumental in setting precedents that influence both levels of government. Key decisions such as District of Columbia v. Heller in 2008 affirmed an individual's right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. However, the ruling also acknowledged that this right was not unlimited and could be subject to regulation. More recently, the Supreme Court's leanings have suggested a tendency to support the right's affirming interpretation of the Second Amendment, which could have substantial implications for federal and state gun laws alike. This judicial trend underscores the continual legal contest over how far the states can go in regulating firearms before bumping up against constitutional protections as interpreted by the highest court in the land. The sharp contrasts in state-level gun laws reflect a broader cultural divide within the nation over the issue of gun control. The variation ranges from strict gun control advocates, who point to the correlation between gun prevalence and gun violence, to staunch gun rights supporters, 
who often cite the necessity of self-defense and the fear of governmental tyranny. This duality has created an environment where common federal standards are challenging to establish, let alone enforce, thereby reinforcing the perception of a fractured and disparate legal landscape when it comes to gun regulation. An additional complexity arises from the sales and transfer of firearms across state lines, which can blur the distinction between state and federal jurisdictions. While federal law regulates interstate commerce of firearms, the internet and private sales at gun shows can obscure the traceability of weapons, making enforcement of disparate state laws all the more difficult. This further complicates the efforts of law enforcement and policymakers who must grapple with the tangible impacts of guns moving from states with lax laws into states with stringent regulations. The existing framework of federal and state gun laws in the United States encompasses a wide array of approaches and philosophies. From stringent background checks to permissive carry laws, these varying legacies continue to shape the national discourse on firearms. However, it is clear that the patchwork nature of gun regulations across federal, state, and local levels presents unique challenges. It reflects the nation's struggle to find a balance between the right to bear arms and the need for effective measures to prevent gun violence. Sorting through this complex network of laws and their real-world implications remains a pressing task for policymakers, law enforcement, and citizens alike as they seek to navigate and influence the future of gun policy in America. 1.5 Cultural Significance of Firearms in the American Psyche The cultural significance of firearms in the United States is profound and deeply interwoven with its history. From the colonization of North America and the Revolutionary War to the taming of the West and the civil rights battles of the 20th century, guns have played a pivotal role in shaping the American psyche. A diverse nation with a multitude of viewpoints, America's relationship with guns is as complex as it is contentious. The Second Amendment of the United States Constitution states, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. These 27 words have been subject to extensive interpretation and debate. For many Americans, the Second Amendment represents a fundamental freedom integral to their conception of individual liberty and protection. It underpins the belief that gun ownership is a right, as vital as freedom of speech or religion. Firearms have not only been seen as tools for protection or sport, but also as symbols of independence and self-reliance. The American frontier, with its challenges and dangers, epitomized the rugged individualism that shaped national identity. Pioneers relied on firearms for hunting, defense and asserting control over their environment. The legacy of the frontier has cemented a cultural ethos where firearms are revered as emblems of empowerment and autonomy. In American popular culture, firearms are ubiquitous. This presence is evident in movies, television, and music, which often glorify the use of guns. Heroes of the silver screen, from the cowboys of the Wild West to law enforcement officers and superheroes, reinforce a narrative where firearms are linked to heroism and justice. This portrayal helps maintain a cultural narrative that associates guns with positive, protective roles in society. Nevertheless, the cultural significance of firearms is not unidimensional. Throughout American history, guns have also been instruments of societal harm. Events like the assassinations of prominent leaders, mass shootings at schools and public venues, and the violence in urban communities underscore a darker side of gun use. These events have fueled a national debate that pits the principles of liberty and personal safety against the responsibility to prevent gun-related violence and casualties. The gun debate is further complicated by regional variations in the United States. Firearms have different cultural implications in rural, suburban, and urban settings. For many rural Americans, gun ownership is a way of life, rooted in hunting traditions and the practical needs of life in areas where police response times may be slow. In urban areas, however, guns are more often associated with crime and law enforcement, leading to a different perspective on their societal role and regulation. Pro-gun advocacy groups, such as the National Rifle Association, NRA, 
have exerted considerable influence on American culture and politics. They emphasize gun ownership as a tradition that embodies core American values and encourage the narrative that a well-armed populace is a safeguard against tyranny. Conversely, organizations advocating for stricter gun control measures argue that the scale and scope of gun violence necessitate considerable constraints to protect public health and safety. Additionally, the gun control debate touches on issues of identity, class, and race. The historical use of firearms in the enforcement of racial segregation and the defense of civil rights highlights the racialized dimensions of gun politics. African American gun ownership has been shaped by a need for self defense in the face of systemic racism and violence, contributing to a complex legacy where firearms signify both oppression and resistance. Community and family traditions around firearms also instill a sense of heritage and continuity. Many Americans grow up with memories of learning to shoot under the guidance of a parent or grandparent, bonding over hunting trips or target shooting. These personal experiences contribute to the esteem in which firearms are held by large segments of the population and shape the collective consciousness regarding gun rights. The rhetoric surrounding gun rights versus gun control has become increasingly polarized, with both sides often seeing the issue as an all-or-nothing battle. This polarization not only reflects the passion and intensity of feelings about firearms, but also hampers the search for common ground and effective policy solutions. Gun control advocates argue for measures like universal background checks, closure of gun show loopholes, and bans on certain types of weapons, while gun rights advocates view such measures as steps toward a slippery slope that threatens to erode their constitutional rights. Despite the deep divisions on gun policy, most Americans can agree that senseless gun violence is a significant problem. There are frequent calls for a reasoned and respectful approach to gun policy making, which would balance the rights of responsible gun owners with the imperative to reduce gun-related injuries and deaths. Crafting such policy, however, remains an immense challenge due to the cultural and ideological beliefs that influence public opinion and legislative action on the issue. Education about firearms and safety is another aspect that plays into the cultural landscape. Advocates from differing perspectives agree on the importance of responsible gun ownership, including safe storage and handling practices. Educational programs aimed at promoting safety and responsible ownership are viewed by many as an essential component of any holistic approach to reducing gun violence. The cultural significance of firearms in the American psyche is complex and multifaceted, reflecting the nation's challenging and often contradictory history with guns. These debates touch on fundamental questions about liberty, safety, and what it means to be American. Within this context, the ongoing national conversation about gun control versus gun rights is not only a discussion of policy and law, but also a reflection of deep-seated cultural values and identities. Although consensus may be difficult to achieve, Understanding the cultural dimensions of firearms is essential for any meaningful dialogue on the issue. 1.6 Global Perspectives on Gun Control Internationally, gun control remains a contentious topic of discussion, with considerable variance in policies and practices across different countries and regions. The spectrum of gun control ranges from the highly restrictive environments of countries like Japan and Singapore to the permissive attitudes found in the United States. By examining global perspectives on gun control, one can better understand the broad array of strategies utilized by governments to address the issues surrounding firearm possession and use, and how these strategies reflect cultural, historical, and legal precedents. In countries such as the United Kingdom and Australia, significant firearm-related events have reshaped public opinion and led to stringent gun control measures. The UK's strict gun laws, including almost a complete ban on handguns, were largely precipitated by the 1996 Dunblane School Massacre. Similarly, Australia's gun laws tightened significantly after the 1996 Port Arthur Massacre. These events serve as pivotal moments in both nations' histories, drawing a clear line between public tragedy and legislative action, demonstrating how such incidents can become catalysts for change. Comparatively, Nations like Switzerland and Finland, while having high rates of gun ownership,
have managed to maintain low levels of gun-related violence through comprehensive regulations and a culture of responsibility among gun owners. These countries often require thorough background checks, mandatory training, and safe storage, which contribute to their relatively low incidence of gun crimes. Such measures suggest that a cultural commitment to disciplined gun ownership coexists with a legal framework designed to enforce safety and responsibility. Furthermore, the relationship between gun control laws and rates of gun violence is frequently under scrutiny. Advocates for gun control often point to statistics from Japan, where gun ownership is closely regulated, and the resulting low rate of gun-related incidents is cited as a testament to the effectiveness of strict gun laws. There, cultural attitudes towards guns are shaped by historical factors and the collective prioritization of public safety over individual gun ownership rights. On the other end of the spectrum, countries like Yemen and Afghanistan display high levels of firearm ownership due to historical, tribal, and political factors. In these regions, access to firearms is often linked to self-defense and resistance ingrained in the societal fabric making gun control efforts vastly more complex and culturally sensitive. These countries highlight the challenges that arise when gun control policies confront deep-seated traditions and practical security concerns. Studies on global gun control also reveal an intersection with international arms trade and trafficking. Countries with more restrictive gun laws may still grapple with illegal firearms entering through porous borders or corrupt channels. This dynamic presents a profound challenge for policymakers seeking to control not just the legality of ownership, but also the reality of access. Regional organizations like the European Union have also taken steps to harmonize gun control legislation among member states, seeking to create a unified approach that addresses the cross-border nature of gun trafficking and crime. The Schengen Information System, for instance, enables information sharing about firearms, their owners, and lost or stolen guns, which is a mechanism aimed at preventing and combating gun-related crime. In contrast to many nations with strict firearms regulations, the United States stands out due to its unique constitutional right to bear arms, as stipulated in the Second Amendment. This legal provision complicates the gun control debate and creates a context that differs vastly from many other countries where gun ownership is not enshrined as a fundamental right. The cultural and political landscape surrounding guns in the U.S. is therefore deeply entrenched and more resistant to change than in other places. Another critical aspect of global perspectives on gun control is the role of international organizations and treaties. The United Nations, through initiatives like the Program of Action on Small Arms and the Arms Trade Treaty, attempts to address illicit small arms trafficking. While these efforts aim to establish common standards, they also confront sovereignty issues, with some nations resisting external oversight of their internal regulations. The global discourse on gun control also implicates considerations about self-defense, national defense, and law enforcement practices. Some countries, citing the need for defense against external threats or internal unrest, maintain permissive gun laws for these reasons. Others argue that an armed populace is necessary to check governmental power, referencing historical tyrannies as cautions against disarmament. When analyzing global gun control measures, it is not only the written law that matters, but also the various ways in which these laws are implemented. Countries with seemingly strict gun laws on paper may have lenient enforcement in practice, resulting in a reality that diverges from the legal framework. Conversely, some countries with more permissive laws may have very strong law enforcement and cultural norms that effectively restrict firearm misuse. It is essential to recognize that no ubiquitous model for gun control can be applied across all countries due to the divergent historical, cultural, and socio-political landscapes that shape each nation's approach. The complexity of gun control is such that each country generally finds a balance that aligns with its unique circumstances, and these balances are subject to change over time as societal attitudes evolve. Lastly, the examination of global perspectives on gun control serves as a reminder that the issue cannot be isolated from the broader context of human rights, public health, and security concerns. Each country's gun control policy contributes to the ongoing international conversation about how to protect citizens, uphold rights, and maintain order.
This multifaceted dialogue remains an important factor in shaping legislative agendas and public opinions around the world. 1.7 Emerging Technologies in Firearms and Regulation The evolution of firearm technology and the corresponding legal frameworks have been sources of considerable debate within the United States. Emerging technologies in firearms have included the use of computer-aided design and manufacturing, developments in smart gun technology, and innovations in materials and ammunition. These advancements are propelled by the dual desire to improve safety and efficiency, but such improvements also bring complex regulatory challenges and raise new concerns for law enforcement and policymakers. Smart gun technology exemplifies the potential for transformative change in the nature of firearms themselves. These guns, often powered by electronic safety features, are designed to be fired only by authenticated users. The technology typically involves biometric sensors or RFID activation, theoretically reducing the risk of unauthorized use. Supporters believe that these features could prevent numerous forms of gun violence, such as accidental shootings, school shootings, and suicides. However, there have been strong oppositions from certain segments of the public and gun rights advocates who contend that smart guns infringe on personal freedom and might fail to work precisely when needed due to technological malfunctions or hacking. Another area of advancement is the emergence of 3D printed firearms. These weapons can be manufactured by anyone with access to a 3D printer, which complicates the traditional regulatory structures governing firearm distribution. Do it yourself guns produced in private homes are usually undetectable by standard security systems and often lack serial numbers making them invisible to the current gun tracking mechanisms. As such, they present a challenge for law enforcement officials tasked with tracing firearms used in crimes. This unregulated manufacturing also poses an unnerving potential for the proliferation of guns that bypass both background checks and mental health screening processes which have been at the forefront of the gun control discussion. The regulatory response to 3D printed firearms remains, to a large extent, unsettled. The debate is centered around the protection of Second Amendment rights versus the need for preventing untraceable and often non-metallic weapons from circumventing security measures. There is an ongoing negotiation between proponents of new technologies who argue for their rights to free speech and free arms under the Constitution, and those who support tighter controls to enhance public safety. Innovations in ammunition technology also carry significant implications for gun regulation. Advancements have led to the creation of bullets that are more powerful, more accurate, and can defeat body armor. Such ammunition sometimes outpaces existing regulatory structures, since most laws have been designed with traditional ammunition in mind. This creates a scenario where stricter controls might be necessary, but these controls must be carefully considered to avoid penalizing law-abiding citizens who use standard ammunition for legitimate purposes, such as hunting or self-defense. The regulatory environment has exhibited both inertia and responsiveness to the changing landscape. In some jurisdictions, there have been efforts to prohibit the possession of certain magazines with capacities beyond a specified number of rounds or to ban the sale of certain types of ammunition. However, such measures face considerable legal challenges and political opposition, often getting tangled in broader contentious debates over gun rights. Additionally, the use of automated and digitally controlled machinery in gun manufacturing has considerably decreased the cost and increased the availability of firearms. This impacts the market and the prevalence of guns in society, as well as the ease with which individuals can modify or assemble firearms at home. Though this has significant implications for both safety and the economy, the regulatory mechanisms have yet to fully keep pace with these technological changes. The intersection of firearms, technology, and regulation also extends to the online realm. The internet has facilitated the sale and trade of firearms between private individuals without the need for them to undergo a background check, depending on the state. The cyber sale of firearms poses distinct challenges in terms of regulating interstate transactions and ensuring compliance with all applicable laws. At the federal level, 
The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives ATF, has struggled with implementing technology-forward policies. Resource limitations and the rapidly advancing pace of technological innovation create a significant lag in response times. Policymakers and enforcement agencies are required to continually adapt to ensure that legislative and regulatory structures are capable of addressing contemporary issues related to firearm technologies. In conclusion, ongoing advancements in firearm technologies will continue to present challenges for lawmakers and authorities. The balance between ensuring public safety, respecting Second Amendment rights, and fostering technological innovation is a fine line to walk, and often, the regulative efforts cannot keep pace with the rate of technological development. As the United States grapples with these issues, the coming years are likely to see significant legal and societal shifts as technology continues to push the boundaries of what is possible with firearms. 1.8 Media's Role in the Gun Debate The media plays a significant role in shaping the public discourse on gun control and gun rights in the United States. With its power to highlight certain events, frame discussions, and influence public opinion, the media's coverage of gun-related issues is a critical element in the ongoing debate. Across various platforms, from television and print journalism to social media and podcasts, the media's treatment of gun violence, legislation and advocacy can sway how these issues are perceived by the public and, consequently, how they are acted upon by policymakers. In the modern landscape, television news outlets are among the most influential media forms and have a profound impact on the gun control versus gun rights debate. Coverage of gun-related incidents tends to be extensive and often emotionally charged. Following mass shootings, for example, television networks may provide continuous updates, profiles of the victims, and discussions of the broader implications for society's relationship with guns. While providing valuable information and fostering public awareness, television news can also contribute to a sense of urgency around the need for policy change, which may either catalyze or polarize public opinion. Print journalism, which includes publications such as newspapers and magazines, has traditionally been known for its in-depth analysis and investigative reporting on issues related to gun control and gun rights. Articles in these media can delve deeply into the complex aspects of the debate, providing historical context, legal analysis, and a range of opinions. This nuanced approach can offer a more balanced view compared to the often reactive coverage on television. However, editorial stances of particular outlets can still influence the nature of the coverage, potentially introducing bias into the narrative presented to readers. The rise of digital media has multiplied the avenues through which audiences can receive information about guns in the United States. Online news sites, blogs, and social media platforms allow for a broader spectrum of voices and viewpoints to be heard. While this can democratize the discourse, it also raises challenges in terms of verifying the accuracy of information. Misinformation in echo chambers can exacerbate divisions between proponents of gun control and supporters of gun rights, with each side having access to tailored content that reinforces their pre-existing beliefs. Social media's role cannot be overstated in today's digital age. Platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram have become battlegrounds for the gun control versus gun rights debate. Users can share news articles, personal stories, and advocacy messages with a broad audience at the click of a button. The viral nature of social media content ensures that particular events or perspectives can gain widespread attention rapidly. Nonetheless, the emotional tone of many social media posts can overshadow substantive dialogue, leading to more polarized and less productive exchanges. Talk radio and podcasts have emerged as influential platforms for discussion on gun-related issues. Hosts and guests on these programs often bring a range of expertise and perspectives to the discourse, from legal and policy analysis to personal anecdotes and emotional appeals. The long-form nature of many such programs allows for a more thorough exploration of the topics at hand, providing listeners with an opportunity to engage deeply with the issues. However, like other forms of media, 
talk radio and podcasts can also serve as echo chambers that reinforce the views of their target audiences without necessarily encouraging critical thinking or dialogue across different viewpoints. Investigative journalism, a hallmark of the media's role in democratic societies, is critical when it comes to gun control and gun rights. Investigative reports can uncover how laws and policies are enacted or enforced, the influence of lobbying groups like the National Rifle Association, NRA, and the impacts of gun violence on communities. These in-depth reports require substantial research and resources, and they can shine a light on areas that may otherwise receive little attention. When well executed, investigative journalism can catalyze calls for change and provide a fact-based foundation for policy discussions. In the context of live media coverage, especially during crises such as active shooter incidents, journalists face the task of swiftly delivering information while ensuring its accuracy. The immediacy of live reporting provides the public with real-time updates during unfolding events, which can be crucial for public safety. However, the fast-paced nature of live coverage can also lead to the dissemination of unconfirmed or incorrect information, which may contribute to confusion and fear. The ethical implications of such real-time coverage require careful consideration by media professionals. Public Service Announcements PSAs, and educational campaigns represent another facet of the media's involvement in the gun debate. These efforts, often conducted in collaboration with government agencies or non-profit organizations, aim to inform the public about issues such as gun safety, the importance of secure storage practices, and the risks associated with firearms. PSAs can play an important role in promoting responsible gun ownership and reducing accidental injuries or deaths related to firearms. The entertainment industry, including film, television shows, and video games, also contributes to the cultural narratives around guns. While often not overtly political, the representation of guns and gun violence in entertainment media can subtly influence public perceptions. Some argue that glorification of guns in popular media can desensitize viewers to gun violence or create misconceptions about the prevalence and nature of such violence. Alternatively, entertainment media sometimes serve as platforms for advocacy, with creators incorporating themes related to gun control or social responsibility into their content. Finally, the feedback loop between public opinion and media coverage is a dynamic aspect of the media's role in the gun control and gun rights debate. Coverage of gun-related issues can reflect and amplify public sentiment, which in turn can affect the nature and focus of subsequent media reporting. This interplay is particularly visible following high-profile incidents of gun violence, when public outcry may lead to increased media scrutiny of gun laws and advocacy efforts. The media thus not only reports on the debates surrounding gun control and gun rights, but also actively participates in and shapes that debate. In analyzing the media's role in the gun debate, it is essential to acknowledge the complexity and diversity of media sources and their varying impacts on the public. The media's representation of gun-related issues is not monolithic, and its influence on the conversation is multifaceted. By recognizing the significance of the media in shaping public discourse, individuals can approach the information they consume with a critical eye, bearing in mind the power of media to shape perceptions, mold opinions, and ultimately influence policy. The media's role in the gun control versus gun rights debate is thus a powerful example of how information dissemination can affect the contours of a national discussion, carrying implications for the direction of society and the formulation of laws that govern it. 1.9 Economic Impact of the Gun Industry The gun industry in the United States is a substantial sector with far-reaching economic implications. It encompasses not only the manufacture of firearms and ammunition, but also their distribution, retailing, and the various ancillary services associated with gun ownership, such as training, licensing, and the provision of shooting ranges. The manifold ways in which this industry touches upon the economy render it both a source of revenue and a point of intense political and social debate. In examining the financial significance of the gun industry, 
it is important to start by considering its size and economic contribution. Reports indicate that the industry has a sizable impact on the United States economy, contributing over $50 billion in total economic activity annually. This estimate includes direct effects such as manufacturing and sales and indirect effects comprising supply chain activities and consumer spending. The industry supports hundreds of thousands of jobs, not only in the production of firearms themselves, but also in the provision of materials and services that are necessary for their manufacture and sale. Employment in the gun industry is multifaceted, involving not just production line jobs, but also positions in research and development, legal compliance, sales, marketing, and IT support. These jobs are often well paid and include various levels of skill requirements, from manual factory work to advanced engineering and management positions. This indicates that the industry plays a critical role in the livelihoods of a diverse cross section of Americans, contributing to the overall employment rate and providing stable incomes in many communities. Beyond direct employment, the gun industry also stimulates job growth in auxiliary and loosely related sectors. For example, there is a steady demand for raw materials such as steel, wood, and polymers, which supports mining, forestry, and chemical industries. Retail establishments that sell firearms and related accessories are additional sources of jobs that range from entry-level clerical to management. Furthermore, hunting and shooting sports, which rely on the availability of firearms, contribute significantly to local economies, especially in rural areas where such activities are prominent. The tax revenue generated by the gun industry is another element of economic significance. It includes income, property, and sales taxes at the state and federal levels. In addition to these, the federal government levies an excise tax on all firearms and ammunition sales. This tax is a source of critical funding for wildlife conservation and habitat restoration projects across the country, as it is administered through the Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act. This law has redistributed billions of dollars to the states for such purposes since its inception in the 1930s. Sales of firearms also have an economic multiplier effect. When individuals purchase a firearm, their spending does not end with the gun itself. They often buy cases, safes, scopes, mounts, and various other accessories. The regular need for maintenance and supplies, such as ammunition, ensures continuous consumer expenditure. The result of this is a robust value chain affecting various businesses. A single purchase can support economic activity in several different industries. Moreover, the economic impact of the gun industry extends internationally. The United States is a major exporter of firearms, which means the industry significantly contributes to the country's trade balance. American-made firearms are sold worldwide for various uses, including sport, hunting, personal defense, and military contracts. This international trade represents a substantial revenue stream and illustrates the competitive advantage American gun manufacturers have in the global market. The economic impact of the gun industry also has regional dimensions. Certain states are more heavily impacted by the presence of gun manufacturers and the culture of gun ownership, leading to local economies that are particularly entwined with firearm-related economic activities. States like New Hampshire, where several large gun manufacturers are headquartered, benefit considerably from the jobs and tax revenues the industry provides. The same can be said for states like Texas and Florida, where favorable business and regulatory environments have attracted firearm-related businesses. However, while the economic benefits of the gun industry are significant, it is also necessary to consider the costs associated with gun violence. There is an undeniable economic toll that arises from the misuse of firearms, including healthcare costs, law enforcement expenditures, and lost productivity. These costs measure billions of dollars annually, and pose a complex challenge when accounting for the overall impact of the gun industry on society. Thus, while the industry generates substantial economic activity, these proceeds are inevitably offset to some extent by the financial burdens associated with weapons misuse. Additional economic analyses focus on the opportunity costs of the gun industry. 
Debates are ongoing about whether resources allocated to the gun industry could be more effectively distributed to other sectors. Critics argue that investments in alternative industries might yield equal or greater economic benefits without the associated social costs. However, such hypothetical scenarios require careful consideration of the specific skills, capital, and infrastructure bound up in the gun industry that may not be easily transferable to other economic sectors. In summary, the economic impact of the gun industry in the United States is considerable. It supports hundreds of thousands of jobs, generates billions in tax revenues, stimulates ancillary business activities, and holds a significant position in international trade. Nevertheless, it is also associated with costs in terms of the economic effects of gun violence and opportunity costs related to resource allocations. As the gun industry continues to grow and evolve, its economic implications remain a critical part of the wider discussion on gun control versus gun rights. Understanding these economic complexities is essential for policymakers and stakeholders to navigate the sector's challenges responsibly and develop informed strategies that consider the full scope of its impacts. 1.10 Community Initiatives and Grassroots Movements The rise of community initiatives and grassroots movements has been a significant development in the ongoing debate between gun control and gun rights in the United States. These movements are often formed in direct response to the failings of legislative measures to address gun-related violence and the perceived inadequacies of government intervention. They manifest as local or national efforts driven by individuals and communities who might feel that their voices and concerns are not adequately represented by the larger political entities. These groups aim to effect change through education, advocacy, and sometimes direct action. A fundamental aspect of these initiatives is their emphasis on local context and the unique experiences of communities impacted by gun violence. Unlike broad legislative policies, grassroots movements have the advantage of focusing on the micro-scale, addressing specific needs and circumstances of an area. This localized approach can foster a more immediate and practical impact as these groups understand the intricacies and dynamics of their own regions. They organize vigils, marches, and meetings, which serve as platforms to share stories, disseminate information, and encourage community participation in the broader national conversation. Education plays a crucial role in community initiatives, as knowledge is seen as a key component in empowering individuals to make informed decisions and to engage in the political process effectively. These organizations frequently host workshops and seminars to inform community members about the implications of gun laws, safe firearms practices, and ways to support at-risk individuals. The educational programs are designed to reach a wide audience, including schools, where the foundation of understanding can influence future generations to make better informed decisions regarding gun rights and gun control. Advocacy is another critical component of these movements. Community initiatives often work to amplify the voices of victims, survivors, and those affected by gun violence that might otherwise go unheard. Grassroots movements use storytelling as a powerful tool to humanize the issue, bringing the abstract and often polarizing debate down to a relatable and emotionally resonant level. Stories of loss and survival can turn statistics into personal narratives that resonate with a broader audience and can inspire action from those who may have been passive observers. Direct action is also a hallmark of many community initiatives. These actions can take the form of public demonstrations, sit-ins, and peaceful protests. They often seek to draw media attention to the cause, aiming to apply pressure on legislators and policymakers to enact or change laws. Moreover, such actions are geared toward keeping the issue in the public eye, maintaining a sense of urgency and ensuring that dialogue continues. The idea is to foster a sustained conversation rather than allowing the subject to fade from public discourse after the news cycle moves on from specific incidents of gun violence. Community initiatives often partner with a myriad of stakeholders including public health organizations, law enforcement agencies, and schools. These partnerships help to create a comprehensive approach to addressing gun violence. By working with law enforcement, 
these groups can gain insights into the trends and patterns in gun-related crimes, ensuring their strategies are informed and effective. Collaborations with public health organizations help frame gun violence as a public health issue, one that requires a collective effort for prevention and intervention. Grassroots movements also play a notable role in supporting the enactment of state and local regulations. These organizations often campaign for background checks, safe storage laws, and red flag laws that allow temporary removal of firearms from individuals deemed to be a threat to themselves or to others. They may track legislation and mobilize members to attend hearings or meet with lawmakers. By doing so, they ensure that constituent voices are a present and influential force within the legislative process. Technology has emerged as an essential tool for community initiatives and grassroots movements. Social media platforms enable them to expand their reach, engage with a broader audience, and build a network of supporters that extends beyond their local area. By leveraging the connectivity of the internet, movements for gun control or gun rights can share stories, updates, and calls to action instantaneously fostering a sense of solidarity among stakeholders and supporters, regardless of their geographic locations. Fundraising is another key aspect that underpins these movements. The ability to raise funds allows for the sustainability of their efforts and can provide the means to develop educational materials, organize events, and support victims and their families. Crowdfunding campaigns, charity events, and merchandise sales are among the many methods these groups employ to secure financial backing. This financial autonomy enables them to campaign vigorously for their cause and to further influence discussion on a national level. These community initiatives and grassroots movements face challenges, including fragmentation and the potential for burnout among volunteers. The sheer number of groups can at times dilute the message or lead to overlapping efforts, which can diminish their overall effectiveness. Furthermore, the emotional intensity of working on issues related to gun violence can take a toll on activists, making sustained engagement over the long term difficult. Despite these challenges, the resilience of such movements is evident in their continued presence and activity in the face of setbacks. As debates about gun control and gun rights continue to be a dominant and divisive issue in the United States, community initiatives and grassroots movements represent an essential piece of the puzzle. They embody the democratic principle of citizens organizing for change, and whether through advocacy, education, direct action, or partnership, they contribute a dynamic and crucial voice to the conversation. While not a panacea for the complex issues surrounding guns in America, these movements play a vital role in shaping the direction of policy, public perception, and ultimately, the safety and well-being of communities across the nation.